Surrender. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. I don't, you know, um, the enemy so be trying his best to stop what God has for us. You know, many times we we doing the work of the kingdom. Distractions want to come or any way it can to to try to stop you and even discourage you from doing what God wants you to do. But I want to thank you all for tuning in, those of you who are on at this moment on the class tonight. I did start at 6 o'clock, and then I got blocked from my live. Um, I guess because I was playing music in the beginning, they blocked me. So I'm glad I had a backup account. So the account you're on now is my backup account. And uh, we're going to continue to keep doing what we have to do to the glory of God. So, Father, in Jesus' name, God, I thank you that you're still good even in this, O oh Lord, that when the enemy comes with a plan to destroy and, to, and distract, O oh God, what you're doing, Father God, to help enhance the knowledge and understanding of the word of God for your people. We ask, Father, you continue to give us strength and power to keep standing on the word of truth in spite of distractions, in spite of the attacks of the enemy, God, for great is he that's in us and he that's in the world. And Lord, give us clear access to the airways tonight, oh God, that your word would, would go across, Father God, unhindered and checked by any demonic force, that you would get the glory. And I give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, everybody. God bless you. God bless you again. Thank you again for tuning in. I'm going to switch on my phone to the other account at the moment, too, and See how it's coming across, actually. Okay, here we go. All right, so we started our lesson. Um, the new lesson tonight is still in the same book, The Incorruptible, the Realm of the Mind. Incorruptible Realm of the Mind. And we're going to talk about renewing your mind, salvation and baptism, transforming the mind. Salvation and baptism, transforming the mind. It's what our discussion is going to start tonight. I started at 6 o'clock, but like I mentioned, got uh, cut off because of Facebook put me, decided to block me. The devil's a lie. He's still not going to be the hinder the word from getting across what God wants to speak to his people. Salvation and baptism. Salvation and baptism. It is very difficult to try to change the mind. It is only a reflection of the heart and cannot really be changed without first tackling the heart. So this point here, you cannot change your mind unless you get to the place in yourself or allowing the Spirit of God to change your heart. Jeremiah 17, chapter verse 11 says, The heart of man is desperately wicked. Who can know it? Save God. He will render to every man according to the fruit of his doings. So God knows the heart of man, and he knows the desires of man. He knows that we are, are human beings, and we're going to make mistakes, and we're going to have thoughts that's not of God, that's going to hinder, distract, and delay the plan of God in our lives. But nevertheless, God is still in control of our thought life, and there's nothing the enemy can do can stop you when God changed your heart. When God changes your heart, your mind changes. And one thing about it, every day we have to gravitate to the Word of God in our thought life, in our mindset. Allow the Word of God to transform our thinking. Because if you don't change your mind, your lifestyle will never change. The reason why so many people are bound right now in religion, so many people are bound in um, demonic forces, uh, doing whatever the enemy put in their mind to do, killing people, running folk over, robbing people, breaking their homes. All these different things are normal response of human nature when you're walking in the absence of God's light and truth in your heart. But the Word of God says until God tackles the heart first, your mind is not going to change because the mind, the heart, the body, the soul, the will, the emotions all works together for the glory of God. And you have to have a desire in yourself to want the Spirit of God to change your thought life. And when you allow the Spirit of God to come inside of you, 
then God will begin to empower you by his spirit. Amen. You cannot change the images displayed by a projector until you until a screen by tackling the screen. So a projector, we all have you know seen projectors before. They use them in churches to uh, uh, to display the music lyrics on the screen or scriptures on the screen or whatever you decide you want to display on your screen. But if the image it appears to be small, do you have to adjust the dial on the projector to enhance the vision of that image to make it bigger? The same way it is in our mindset. The Spirit of God has to touch the heart of man to begin to adjust the dial of the image of the Spirit of God to be reflected in your mindset. The Word of God only has the power to influence, to enlighten, and to change your life only when you allow the Spirit of God the opportunity and the right and permission to change your heart. As such, the heart is the main factor when it comes to the mind. The heart is the main factor, the main component when it comes to changing your mind. You can be in a relationship and the relationship can be one-sided because the other individual is not putting up any effort to make the relationship work. Or it can be a person in relationship always being toxic, always speaking negative things, always shutting down your dreams and visions, always never have anything good to say about you to enhance your growth. That's toxic. And one thing about God, God makes us aware of the enemy's devices. So be not deceived. What the man soweth, that should he also reap. So if you're sowing negative things in your life constantly and you gravitate to negative things, the result is negativity. Your life is going to respond to whatever you allow the enemy to inflict you with. You have to make a choice in yourself that I'm going to serve God with my heart, my soul, my mind, my will, my emotions. Everything about me is going to be gravitated, be driven and guided by the Holy Spirit. The contents of the heart determine whether a person is heavily, earthly, or hell-minded. The contents of the heart. What's your contents? What is it that's driving you? What is it in your heart that's controlling you? And it's your decision in yourself to make a decision to follow after truth or follow after a lie. It's up to you. The only way you're going to overcome the thought life of the enemy is allowing the Spirit of God to change your heart. So whatever contest in your heart is either going to be heavenly, where you're going to dwell in the heavenly minded, ascending in the kingdom of God, or earthly, in the carnal mind, where your mind is driven, guided by the dictates of the flesh, or hell-minded, where you have the power and authority of the enemy destroying your life. To be hell-minded is to be governed and led and guided by the enemy from the power of hell, which is nothing but destruction. The worlds are in the hearts of men by their contents, and the mind reflects these worlds. He has made everything beautiful in his time. He also set the worlds in, in the hearts so that no man can find out the works that God makes from the beginning to the end. How then is a world set in a person's heart? How then is a, is a world set in a person's heart? World here is not a physical dwelling place, rather dimension with the kind of knowledge and work in it. So we have the right to ascend into the dimensions beyond the natural realm into the heavenly realm and be governed and guided and dictated by the leadership of the Holy Spirit through the knowledge 
of God's word. The more I gravitate to the knowledge of God's word, God sets his world in our hearts, which is the kingdom dominion of the kingdom of God. So that's when you know you're a citizen of the heavenly kingdom, living in the kingdom realm, no longer being guided by the kingdom of this world or the power of this world. For a world to be set in the heart of a person means the knowledge and work in that world has entered and filled his heart. So in order for the world to control your life, it has to be set in your heart through the information, through the governing rules and, and knowledge and the wisdom and the dominion, not only that is rules and regulations must be set in your heart in order for it to work in your, in your life. There is knowledge and work in this physical world which upon being set in man's heart makes him earthly minded, giving him a place and jurisdiction in the realm of this world. That is so amazing because when you don't know the dominion and authority you have and the power you have at your exposal from the kingdom of God, then you allow yourself to be earthly minded, which is carnality. And a mind that's set on the flesh is an enemy of God. <coughs> Excuse me. The mind that's set on the flesh becomes an enemy of God that's earthly minded. So anything the flesh wants to do absent of the light of God's word, guess what? The flesh is going to do it. The flesh is going to gravitate to the things that appeases itself because it doesn't want to obey God, neither can it be without the spirit of God. you got to have the spirit of God inside of you in order to, to guide and govern and lead your flesh in the way of truth and righteousness. The knowledge of the world placed in you. This goes beyond being merely aware of the operations in given world. So if the knowledge of the world is placed in you, it goes beyond the operations of the world. Why? Because knowledge is power. The more I know, the further I can go in life. Just like in the corporate world. You go apply for a job and they're looking for uh, a CEO, and you done went to school, got your education, you, you done studied, you know the ins and outs of what to do as a CEO, and you come to present yourself for an interview, and you begin to give bits and pieces of the knowledge and the wisdom you attain through your career, it sets you in place of power to get a position as a CEO. Check this out. Isaiah chapter 54, verse 17. Isaiah chapter 54, verse 17. No weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper. And every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment thou shalt condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is of me, says the Lord. What Jesus was talking about, I mean, Isaiah was prophesying about, was talking about the enemy forming weapons in your life. God showed me something. That many times our conversation, the words that we're allowed to come out of our mouth, it forms weapons against ourselves. Not only does it form a weapon against yourself, it brings destruction in yourself. Because the words that you speak, if they're not the words of life from the word of God, you're going to listen to the voice of reasoning, the voice of the enemy, and the enemy going to use your words against you. And the same words you speak is going to begin to assassinate everything that God has set in motion for your life to prosper you. And it hinders you, it delays you from advancing in the kingdom of God. Amen. Amen. The mind is filled with the intents of the heart. And that gives the mind a place in the world which it belongs. So what's your intentions? What's your motive? What is this driving you? What is guiding you? What is influencing you? The, the intentions of the heart. 
So in my heart, my intentions is always devise evil. Guess what happens? My thought life is going to be governed with the same type of mindset. And I'm going to begin to manifest those thoughts into actions because there was an intention of my heart to do harm to somebody else. Not only to somebody else, but to myself. God showed me something. A lot of times when our bodies become afflicted, we allow those things to manifest in our lives because of our confession. So I get into agreement with what my mind thought about, what someone else spoke over me. I allow those words that have been spoken into my life to manifest. So now I become destructive to my own self, my own health. So the more I get into agreement that, oh, I'm sick, I ain't gonna never get well. It seems like I'm always having the same issue, always having the same problem. My children are always making the same mistakes. My life is a wreck. Self-assassination are the very words that come from the thought life that enter into your heart, comes out of your mouth. And everything you speak begins to manifest because you gave it power to do it. But he turned to Peter, said, get out of the way, Satan. You are a danger to me because your mind is not on the things of God, but on the things of men. Matthew chapter 16, verse 23. Apostle Peter was filled with the knowledge that the master could not die. He was the savior. This was the only in the knowledge of men. Unknown to Peter, the devil was behind this knowledge, projected into his heart, giving rise to the place of his mind. The devil was the prince of the world. Jesus, knowing this, rebuked the source of that knowledge in the world. The devil was speaking through Peter's mind by the knowledge of his heart of the world. The world in the heart of man must be changed for the mind to respond. That is so powerful. The world, which was the kingdom of darkness, the enemy's world, the heart of man must be changed in order for the mind to change. If you want success in anything you do, think about it. Speak it over yourself. Pray on it. Begin to thank God for it. Thank God for your success. Thank God for your blessings and favor. Thank God for traveling ministry. Thank God for whatever it is you desire, a new car, a new house, a relationship. Thank God for it and trust God at his word that my heart would line up with his word to manifest his will in my life. And I guarantee when you do that, it doesn't matter what thought life the enemy tries to inflict upon you. The Holy Spirit has the power to overthrow the thought for the enemy and give you the mind of Christ. That is so powerful. Salvation. Salvation. Salvation brings to mind two things. Being taken from one end and being placed in, in another. Salvation in this context, it means to be rescued from the kingdom of this world, which is the kingdom of darkness into, the, into that of the sun. Salvation means to be rescued from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son. The world here is knowledge that keeps men earthly. The world, the knowledge of the world will keep you earthly, not making them perceive any knowledge beyond the physical dimension. This is a great bondage since the physical world is merely a place of manifestation of the operations from the spiritual worlds. So if you keep your mind earthly, you're going to be governed by the physical dimensions of the world of the kingdom of darkness. And that becomes bondage. That's why so many people that have been in church for 30 and 40 and 50 years are still bound in a place of darkness and bondage because they allow themselves to be inflicted by the enemy thought life. And that thought life controls your actions. It controls your entire life. It sets your de destiny and an assassination against your destiny. And the enemy uses those things as tools to manipulate and to control your thoughts. 
earthly minded men would never have control over what the happenings of this world since it is not in the domain of the physical world to control. By earthly mindedness, people are slaves to this world. Earthly mindedness will cause you to become a slave to the world system, the world belief system, to religion. And God doesn't want us to be religious. He wants us to have a relationship with him. The most important thing you can do as a child of God is have a relationship with God. The kingdom of the devil is of the world with an active knowledge that produces fear unto death. So the enemy's MO is to come into your life to feed you fear, doubt, and unbelief. And when he does that, he knows he got you in a trap. Therefore, like last week I talked about how Satan will bait you. He'll set things before you to present something that you like the most that can entice and lure you into a trap. So everything that he brings before you is for your demise, to destroy you. So as a child of God, you got to be aware, be on guard. Guard your heart, Proverbs 4.23, for out of its flows the issues of life. So you got to guard your heart. Once men are blind to the truth, which is the word of God, the devil still remains the prince of the world and the operation of his kingdom creeps into the domain of men. So if Satan will keep you blinded from the truth, he keep you in his dominion. And that's what he's talking about. He keep you entrapped in his kingdom. This is how, this is how come the devil easily used Peter to attempt to deceive Jesus. And the scripture goes on from Matthew chapter 16, verse 21 through 23. It says, from that time on, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, and the experts of the law, and be killed, and on the third day be raised. So Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. God forbid, Lord, this must not happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me, because you are not setting your mind on God's interests, but on man's. Isn't that powerful? Jesus rebuked the enemy that was using Peter's mind to assassinate the plan God had for Jesus. Anytime we allow our own interests to overpower the mind of the Holy Spirit, that's the mind of the enemy. And the enemy uses your own thought life to make you doubt God's word and get you to speak things and spur out things out of your mouth that is not of God to hurt somebody else or even hurt yourself. Salvation is the rescue or deliverance from darkness into light. Salvation is the rescue or deliverance from darkness into light. Darkness here is any knowledge that destroys, produces fear, or death. Darkness is the knowledge that destroys and brings fear and death, and itself is deceit to the blind men from the knowledge of the truth that is set in them, that sets them free. So the enemy uses use your, own, your own darkness which is of him, to keep you entrapped in blindness from knowing the truth that has the ability to set you free. So when you give in to the kingdom of darkness, you give in to the enemy's influences, his dominion, his authority to control your thought life, to speak against the truth of God's word for your own demise. And in the process, he uses it to destroy you and kill you who has delivered us from the power of darkness and has translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. Colossians chapter 1, verse 13. Colossians chapter 1, verse 13. By this, anyone entering the kingdom of the son has been delivered from the power of darkness. 
Jesus explains the entry into the kingdom as being born again in his conversation with Nicodemus. So when you receive salvation, that's being born again from darkness into light. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. It's so important that you and I, my brothers, my sisters, get a revelation of what salvation really is to us. And allow the power of our Savior, the sacrifice that was paid for our sin and iniquity, transform our mindset from darkness to metamorphosize our minds into the kingdom and the mind of Christ, that we can live a fruitful and a free life in Christ Jesus. Jesus went ahead and explained what it meant to be born again when Nicodemus did not understand what he was talking about. Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. St. John chapter 3 through 5. Verse 3 through 5. St. John chapter 3, verse 3 through 5. Unless you be born again, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. And what he's talking about is not a physical kingdom. It's the spiritual kingdom in your mindset. Changing your thought life from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of God, allowing the kingdom dominion and the kingdom authority to enter into your heart to transform your life. To become more and more like Christ Jesus. This misunderstanding. So the misunderstanding with these scriptures. That is being born again. Only makes you see the kingdom as one would. Have been born of water. And in the spirit. In order to enter the kingdom. Kingdom of God. Verse 5 was just an explanation. Of being born again. Which mentioned in verse 3. Not a different requirement for entry. He only gave the verse 5 to answer the question to Nicodemus. In verse 4, Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time to his mother's womb and be born again? St. John chapter 3, verse 4. So Jesus answered his question. He asked the question. Jesus gave him an answer. A profound statement. You must be born again of spirit and of the water. The water is for the cleansing. The Spirit for the renewal of the new birth. So once I go through the water of baptism, of taking off the old lifestyle, the old mindset, I can put on the new nature after the Spirit of living God by receiving Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. That is so powerful. Thus by answering, thus by the answer of Jesus, salvation is broken down into two steps. Being born of water and being born of spirit. Being born of water means to be cleansed by the word of God. Being cleansed by the word of God. Being born of water being, means to be cleansed by the word of God. Not just that, but water baptism. Before anyone can be saved, the gospel is first preached. That is a very profound statement you need to write down. Before anyone can be saved, the gospel of salvation is first preached. So there's something you need to put in your library and you write on your tablet, put on your notes. Before anybody can be born again, the gospel has to be preached. The gospel of salvation is the initial message of the kingdom of God to man. The gospel of salvation is the initial message of the kingdom of God to man. However, there is more to the kingdom than salvation. Anything in the kingdom of God is not accessible to the one who is not part of it. So that means the blessings, the favor, the promises, the visions, the dreams that God gives you, if it's not, if you're not part of the kingdom of God, you're not part of the benefits of the kingdom of God. You cannot have the benefits of a believer unless you be born again. 
This is why salvation is the first message of the kingdom aimed at rescuing men from the power of darkness into glory and the liberty of the kingdom of God. This is so good. That's why salvation has to be preached, the message, to deliver men from the power and control of the enemy that's in darkness into the glorious kingdom of our Savior. Without salvation, whatever the kingdom has to offer is irrelevant to man. Without salvation, whatever the kingdom of God has to offer to you is irrelevant. You cannot attain it. You cannot have it. You cannot achieve it. You cannot enjoy it until you first be born again. The preaching of the good news of salvation is to inspire faith. The preaching of the good news of salvation is to inspire faith. Without faith, it is impossible to enter the kingdom of God. Without faith, it is impossible to enter into the kingdom of God. The gospel of salvation is aimed at causing a person to ignore his present state, to believe his justification by the standards of the kingdom of God. In other words, when the gospel is preached, the gospel gives you the insight. It gives you understanding. It gives you the knowledge, revelation, <clears throat> excuse me, to believe in the justification that Christ paid the price for your sin and iniquity to bring you new life through his death, burial, and resurrection by the standards of the kingdom of God then every precious promise that God has for you, you can achieve it by faith. Because the gospel, it builds your faith to trust in God's ability to save you, deliver you, and set you free. The message of the kingdom of God just says Jesus has qualified you for the kingdom of God. Holding on to this word and ignoring the present state of your ticket into the kingdom. So God through Jesus Christ, qualified you, justified you, made you righteous, gave you the right and the privilege to come into his kingdom, to receive all the benefits of the kingdom. It's like saying to a person, someone has paid your school fees, go there, mention his name, and your documents will be handed over to you. The kingdom of God is, is of faith, and everything it has to offer is received by faith. Everything that you want from God to do in your life today, my brother, my sister, is only done by faith in God's ability to do it. The kingdom of God is of faith, and everything it has to offer is received by faith. It is only those who still hold to the understanding that they have to do something or to qualify that find the difficult entry to the kingdom. So if you think your works is what's going to qualify you. It's going to be difficult to enter the kingdom of God or even to the kingdom principles or the kingdom benefits because you, you're trying to do it by works. And works does not work by itself without faith. Faith without works is dead. But when you mix your works and your faith together to do the work of the kingdom of God, then it gives you the entitlement to receive all the benefits that God has for you. That is it. That's shouting news right there. Hallelujah. Faith is so basic. Anyone who can use a coupon or respond to a discount has faith. It means you held on to the words of the service when you receive the message of the coupon or the discount sale. You do not have to receive discounts by the works, by your works. Discounts are the works of the seller, and you enjoy them when you act upon receiving the knowledge of them. So if someone comes to you and says, I'm giving you an all-paid uh, coupon to go uh, go to resort. You don't have to do them, but just show up there. They did the work for you to get the coupon to give you the right and the entitlement to go to the resort to have a free benefit of, of staying at the resort. So all you have to do is receive it. Salvation is the same way. It entitles you that Jesus was the seller when he paid the price on the cross for your sins and your iniquity, 
He gave you the coupon, which gave you the right to receive the gospel of salvation so your life will be born again. And because of that, that every precious promise, I say it again, is yours. The word says that Abraham, the father of faith, believed God that everything that God spoke to him that he would do in his life, that he would benefit from his belief in God, what God spoken as the father of many nations, and, and be blessed and all the kingdom of the world be blessed by him because he believed that now we're benefit beneficiaries of the same Abrahamic covenant that God spoke to Abraham. So everything that God promised that you're going to be the father of many nations, you're going to be blessed beyond measure. You can look at the, the stars and then you can count so much. I have blessed thee. Everything that God said to Abraham, he spoke to you and I. So if I can see myself, when I was going through cancer, I always remember this one point. God spoke to me. He said, think yourself well. Think yourself well. I use the same principle in anything I do. I think myself successful. I think myself being a great speaker. I think myself being a great teacher. I think myself in line with the word of God, where God has spoken to me through his word. So I was lying in the hospital bed. God says, by stripes, you're healed. He says, so think yourself well. Now as I begin to think myself well and find scriptures that validated that I was already healed by the stripes of Jesus Christ, it began to manifest in my body because I changed my thought life by allowing my heart to be changed by the word of God. So once my heart got aligned with the word of God, my mind and my thought life began to change and come into agreement with everything God has spoken. So I want to encourage you tonight, it doesn't matter what you're going through in your life, it is going to change, it has to change, but it's based on your faith in God. As you trust God's ability to manifest his promises in your life, to give you a better job, to give you a better car, to open doors that you need open, close doors that need to close, put people in your life to, to help you get to the place you need to go to be successful, relationship, connections. God's going to do just that according to your faith. That means you got to hold on to the word of God. So the message of salvation is the kingdom of God giving you free entry and membership. You act upon receiving the message the same way you respond to the discounts. So the message of the cross, the gospel, gave you free access to become a member of the body of Christ. So you have free entry and free membership into the kingdom of God. There's no more being denied access. There's no more being put out of the promises God has for you. Because everything God spoken in his word, it has to manifest because he spoke it, it was done, he commanded, and it stood fast. So what God speaks in your life, my brother and my sister, you can guarantee God's going to back his word up. That word shall manifest in your life. You just got to believe it. You might need a job tonight. You might need a new home. You might need a, a, a new car. You might need to get, get into a place of having school bills paid, debts being paid. Doesn't matter what it is. Change your thought life. Align your mind with the word of God. And allow the word of God to manifest in your thought life. And I guarantee the word will begin to produce fruit in your life to bring into reality the things you've been praying for and trusting God to do. All you got to do is act upon receiving the message the same way you respond to discounts. Someone give you discounts, the same response and excitement you get when you get a discount is the same response you need to have for God. That God, you gave me the right to have anything I want in this life, to have life and that more abundantly. The word said, the thief come nigh, but the kill, steal, and destroy. But I am, the great I am, come to give you life and that more abundantly. But you got to receive it by faith. To those of the law, the good news that is Christ met the full punishment of the law for their freedom. 
to those of the law, the good news is that Christ met the punishment, the full punishment of the law for your freedom. See, when you understand what it's talking about here, read the story of the children of Israel, how many times they were bound by the law and decreed because they rebellion. So God allowed law to be put in, in force and in action to point them to Christ, get them to a place of stop sinning. But because of that, it became a requirement that if you sin, you were punished. So Jesus, come along in the New Testament, fulfills the law, takes the punishment and requirements upon himself for our liberty. So no, now we're no longer bound to this law as a binding contract, but now we've been set free by the power of the blood of the Lamb. The blood paid the price for the contract, for, for the contract of your punishment. The law is only a binding to a man so long as he alive. But when he dies, he's no longer under the law. He is free. When Christ died, all those under the law died with him. They are all free from the law since the law does not work beyond death. This is indeed good news to those under the law. They died with Christ so that the law no longer binds them. They have been made free from the law. So you've been made free. I've been made free from the bondage of the law, the control of the law, the system of the law. I've been set free. When Christ died, the word says we died with him. And when he rose, we rose with him to new life. So guess what? The law that said that you were held in condemnation for the sins and iniquities and things you committed, Jesus paid the price for that punishment. Therefore, now is no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. So as you've been brought into the new life through the gospel, now you've been set free from the punishment of the law. And now you've been given the right and the entitlement to the benefits of everything that Christ has fulfilled through his sacrifice. For the love of Christ constraineth us because we thus judge that if one died for all, we then all did. And that he died for all, that they which lie should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14 and 15. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14 and 15. So, the love of Christ constrains us. It compels us. It holds us in conviction that when Christ died, we all died. But then when he rose again from the dead, we rose with him to the new life. So we're no longer victims of condemnation. Now we've been set free by the life of Christ. For those no longer under law or, get, or even attempting to live by them, their good news is not in the death of Jesus. It's in the irrelevant to them. It's irrelevant to them. So people who continue to live under the law, it's irrelevant that Christ died for them. For such people, the good news is that eternal life has come unto them in the person of Jesus. And Jesus is the eternal life of the Father and the knowledge of Jesus gives them eternal life. To know him is eternal life. This is not a complex as it seems. It's not as complex as it seems. When a student enters into a law school, he is not a lawyer, but something very interesting happens. In the course of his schooling, the personality of the lawyer is revealed to him. The personality of a lawyer here means the full statute of a lawyer with every knowledge that makes him a lawyer who is who, who he is. The full statute of a lawyer is gradually revealed to the student by the words coming from the tutor. So as a person goes to school for law school, it's saying you, you're not going to get the revelation until the tutor begins to reveal to you the statutes and the qualifications of a lawyer. So once you begin to retain that information, now you get a revelation that I'm a lawyer. Every word that a student receives is a personality of a lawyer being given to him. As a student continues to receive these words, the personality of a lawyer is gradually formed in him. And when he comes to full stature, you will no longer see a student 
you will see him a lawyer. So once you get a revelation of what Christ has called you to be, then you begin to walk in it. You begin to live in it. You begin to manifest it everywhere you go. That I'm a child of God. I'm an heir of the kingdom. I'm blessed and highly favored because now I believe it. I receive it and I accept what God has done for me. And now I'm living and abiding in it. In the same way, every word concerning a person of Jesus is eternal life. The one not under the law has to receive Jesus in the knowledge that he is eternal life of God. And this is where he has to also to exercise his faith. And human education can give a person what it stands for. Jesus also gives what he stands for, for eternal life. So even human education, it begins to give you understanding of what, the, what life is about for you in that type of degree that you're going for, a career you're trying to achieve, the same way it is in Christ Jesus as eternal life. And thou hast given him power of all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. That is powerful. St. John chapter 17, verse 2 and 3. St. John chapter 17, verse 2 and 3. And thus each category is what is expected to believe by what is preached. Those of the law have believed they are free from the law by the death and resurrection of Jesus, and those without law believe that Jesus is a person of eternal life. Believing this message of salvation is referred to as being born of water. Believing the message of salvation, which was preached to you, is as demonstration of faith, the basic factor of the kingdom of God. So believing the message of salvation is like being born of water, being cleansed through the water of the word. But believing the message of salvation that was preached is a demonstration of faith. Because without faith, you can't receive salvation. Once you believe, you are cleansed by the washing of the water, by the word which is preached to you, that he might sanctify and cleanse you with the washing of water by the word. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 26. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 26. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Hallelujah. Glory to God. You are now clean. Through the words which I have spoken unto you. St. John chapter 15 verse 3. St. John chapter 15 verse 3. Once the message of salvation is believed, the evidence is given by the confession. Once the message of salvation is believed, the evidence is given by your confession. Confessing what you believe by hearing the message of salvation is the testimony before the kingdom of God that you are of faith. So you believe the message and confess with your heart what God has done for you is an operation of faith in the kingdom of God. This testimony is very vital. It is an open confession to the kingdom of God which you cannot see with your physical eye. For those of the law, that is faith confession of the Lordship of Jesus, his death and his resurrection. So believe the word of God, stand on the word of God, and know the word of God for yourself. We're almost done. I have a few more scriptures. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe in thy heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Romans chapter 10, verse 9. Romans chapter 10, verse 9. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. St. John 15, verse 3. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. But Romans chapter 10, verse 9, that thou shalt confess thy mouth, believe in thy heart, that God raised it from the dead, thou shalt be saved. But for those without law, this is a confession that Jesus is the Son of God. For those without law, this is a confession that Jesus is the Son of God. And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Matthew chapter 16, verse 16. Matthew chapter 16, verse 16. Hallelujah. And we believe and are sure that, that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And we believe and are sure that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. 
St. John chapter 6, verse 69. St. John chapter 6, verse 69. Amen. Hope you're writing these scriptures down. These are some good scriptures to go back and, and reflect over for salvation if you want to learn how to minister to somebody else about salvation. These are some of the very scriptures you can use. And then the confession of faith seals the cleansing of water by the word. The confession of faith, it seals the cleansing by the water of the word. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Romans chapter 10, verse 9 and 10. Romans chapter 10, verse 9 and 10. Also, when you get, get a revelation that your confession it introduces salvation to your heart, it changes your mind to believe that you are what Christ says you are, a child and an heir of the kingdom of God. And as an heir, we all know what an heir is. When a person, loved one, pass away, they leave you their benefits that you're entitled to when they pass away in their will. So you become an heir. So everything they have wrote in their will, for certain individuals get certain things of their, of their property, you're entitled to it because now you're an heir. And it's written in documentation that validates that you are, have the right to, to attain it. Being born of water or being cleansed by water, by the washing of water, by the word, is one part of the salvation process. It does not end there. Jesus did not just preach to his disciples. The confession of faith is what allows a person to be saved and is not in itself the end of salvation. The preaching of the message of salvation is to inspire faith in the heart of man in order to be saved. The preaching of the message of salvation is to inspire, to encourage, to stir up, to stretch the faith in the heart of man in order to be saved. And when you attain the word of God, the gospel in your heart, it entitles you to the right to receive salvation and deliverance from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light and to be transformed, metamorphosized from the mind of the flesh to the mind of Christ. And I guarantee when you do that, allow the word of God to get into your heart, you're going to find yourself being excited for the joy. Want to tell everybody about the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ, what God has done for you. So share your testimony. Share your story. Because a lot of people ask, how can I uh, uh, minister to somebody else's salvation? Because sometimes we have apprehension or might be fearful. But one of the tactics I found out that opens the avenue to begin to minister to somebody the gospel of Jesus Christ is sharing a story about yourself, some things you've been through, your testimony, and how God delivered and brought you through the things you went through, which opens up the conversation to introduce the gospel of Jesus Christ. And when you do that, now you get give their attention and they're ready to receive what you have to offer to them, the free gift of salvation. Amen? Why my nose keep itching? But anyway, we're going to end right here. Next week, we'll continue talking about being born of the Spirit. But I thank you for tuning in tonight. I pray that you stay encouraged, stay excited about Jesus, stay in your Word, study the Word, meditate on the Word, allow the Word to transform your, your mindset to the mind of Christ. And I guarantee that you will find yourself living a more fruitful, a more freer, and abundant life in the kingdom of God. So, Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you for your word tonight, O oh God. I pray your word has not fallen from deaf ears, but your word shall manifest, O oh God, to bring changes in all of our hearts, our minds, our conversation, our entire life will be changed by the power of the living God, that you will be glorified. And I thank you for it, God, in Jesus' name. Amen. If you don't know Jesus tonight as your Lord and Savior, I would encourage you to get to know him as your Savior tonight. 
And I, I guarantee that when you do that, God will begin to transform your mindset, your heart, your will, your emotions, begin to fill your heart, flood your heart with the truth of his word and forgive you for your sins and give you a new heart to serve him. And I tell you that when you do that, you find yourself walking in the truth of the gospel, in the new life, in Jesus Christ. So I want you to pray this simple prayer with me. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you, Lord God, for loving me and for giving me for my sins and giving me another chance. Come into my heart. Forgive me for my sins and wash me in the blood of the Lamb. Cleanse my mind, cleanse my heart, change my life. And I thank you in Jesus' name. Now fill me with the Holy Spirit to be a witness for you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 I want to thank you tonight for attending. I don't know that the enemy tried to stop it, but God still prevails anyhow. I give God the glory. But also, I would like for you to sow a donation to the ministry. Doesn't matter the amount. And this seat is going toward our building fund for our church. We're in the process of expanding our building and we're trusting God to, to uh, provide the resources. And also it helps with the materials, the books that I get to, to uh, teach the lessons each week. Just ask for your donation. Doesn't matter what if a dollar, five dollars, ten dollars, whatever God put in your heart. So you'll see an expectation of God meeting your need. And it, it works. The principle of sowing and reaping, it works. I'm a living witness. Every time I sow a seed, it always comes back to me double or more because I trust God His word. I don't just give and not expect God to do anything with it. But I give and I pray over my seed and I tell God, Lord, I thank you for the seed. The debts are being canceled. Bills are being paid in full. Father, that your kingdom being expanded, you meet the needs of your people. In the mighty name of Jesus, I pray. And then I thank you, Lord. Your word says that we give and come back to good measures, pressed down, shaking together, running over till men give us our bosom. And you know what? Every time I do that, it always manifests in my life a blessing from God. Unexpected checks in the mail, favor in the ministry. Doesn't matter which avenue it comes from, God does just that by faith. So I encourage you, get into the habit of sowing seeds into a ministry. Don't have to be this ministry. Sow a seed in somebody's ministry. If you know that ministry is blessing you, sow your seed. And I tell you, when you walk in obedience, as God says, sowing your seed, he loves a cheerful giver. He said, give not of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. God will bless you in return every single time. I guarantee you. So I, until next week, the Lord says the same. You all stay excited about Jesus. Stay encouraged. Know that God is on your side. And that he's working things out in your favor. Doesn't matter what the enemy tries to do to hinder and stop you. Walk in your purpose. Walk in the promises God has spoken to you. Walk in the vision God has given you. Don't allow yourself to hinder your own vision, your own destiny that God has set before you. Because when you pray over what God has told you to do and trust God to do it, watch it work. May not happen today, may not happen tomorrow, might be a year later. I was prophesied years ago about being in leadership in, over ministry. And guess what? God has done that several times in my life, placed me in a position where I'm always in leadership, doing something for the kingdom of God. And, I, and that was over 20 years ago. A man came from out of town from Oklahoma and prophesied that a word over me. And I trusted God's word. I kept believing the word until that word began to manifest. And I tell you, every word that God speaks in your life, he said it would not come back to him void. That means empty. It would not manifest. But he said it shall prosper to the place he sent it and do as he pleased. So I guarantee when you trust God's word, his word will manifest in your life. Stay encouraged. Stay excited about Jesus. And know that God loves you, and so do I. Shalom. Peace be unto you. If you have any questions, inbox me your questions, and I'll, I'll answer your question, and it's to, my, to the satisfaction of the Holy Spirit. And I, I pray that 
you all be blessed and continue to be covered with the Spirit of the living God. As you go out, you're blessed coming in, you're blessed going out. And everything you touch will be blessed in Jesus' name. Amen.